So when I was 10 years old, I went to India for the first time. And as I fidgeted in my seat and waited for the plane to arrive, I dreamt of all of the sights that I would soon see. I was thrilled to have the opportunity to experience the splendor of the Taj Mahal and to visit the cities where my grandparents grew up. When I stepped off the plane, however, I was greeted by an unfamiliar sight. I was greeted by a curtain of thick gray smog. My eyes burned, as did my lungs, and as a person with asthma, I found it nearly impossible to breathe. The pollution would continue to be an issue for me throughout my trip. I had asthma attacks even inside and had to wear my mother's scarf around my face just so that I could avoid the toxic air. As I would later learn, the pollution that choked the air in India was only a symptom of a larger issue, the climate crisis. I couldn't fathom how people had to live like this and how children had to live like this every single day. When I was 10 years old, I had never truly thought about the climate crisis before. I had bought into the narrative that it was a far off phenomenon, that it would impact my grandchildren and not me. After all, if the climate crisis was truly a crisis, I would have learned about it in school. And if the climate emergency was truly an emergency, we would stop drilling for fossil fuels immediately because the best way to get yourself out of a hole is to stop digging, right? Little did I know that I was not the only one who was outraged at this injustice. Just a few months prior to my trip, indigenous youth had defended their land at Standing Rock leading the fight against the Dakota Access Pipeline. Then, two years later, youth-led climate organization Zero Hour would go on to host the first ever Youth Climate March on Washington. And that same year, then 15-year-old Greta Thunberg would go on school strike for climate every day outside of the Swedish Parliament building, asking our world leaders why should should she be forced to study for a future that may cease to exist due to the climate crisis. Her movement was dubbed Fridays for Future and to her surprise, millions would soon follow her lead. When I was younger, however, few adults within my circle of family and friends were talking about climate change, much less taking action on it. I didn't know that I had power, that I could do anything. After all, I was only 10 years old. So while the issue always lingered at the back of my mind, I never acted on my fears, trusting the adults in my world to do what was best for my life. Then my state caught on fire. In 2018, a horrific wave of fires ravaged California. Of these, the most infamous is the Paradise Fire or the campfire. The campfire occurred in Paradise, California, only two hours away from where I live in Sacramento. Fires like these are getting stronger due to the climate crisis and dry conditions allow them to spread faster. Because Sacramento is only two hours away from Paradise, we got a lot of the smoke. Once again, smoke choked the air and I struggled to breathe. The fire department handed out flimsy masks. My friend even jokingly made a song about how hard it was to breathe, appropriately titled, If You Breathe, You're Gonna Die. I had asthma attacks inside, and our homeless were ordered to get off of the streets because it wasn't safe to be outside. Schools were closed, and everybody was impacted. And yet I couldn't feel too bad for myself. After all, in Paradise, California, the residents had fared much worse. They had lost their homes, their possessions, and maybe even their loved ones. Their entire lives had been reduced to fragments of ash. I knew that I had to take action. So in 2019, I started Fridays for Future Sacramento a youth-led climate organization that organizes in accordance with the Global Fridays for Future movement. And on September 20th, 2019, we organized Sacramento's largest ever climate strike, which saw over a thousand attendees. 
I later joined Earth Uprising, a global youth-led climate organization, and became their global partnerships coordinator. I have now been part of numerous campaigns for climate justice, including a campaign to urge the city of Sacramento to declare a climate emergency. I'm pleased to report that Sacramento's climate emergency declaration passed unanimously. However, we still have an incredibly long way to go before our emissions stop rising. Many see the youth climate movement as an anomaly, but the idea that youth can have a transformative impact within social justice movements is hardly new. After all, in the 1960s during the civil rights movement, youth called for integration, and during the civil rights movement, student from, students from North Carolina organized the now famous Greensboro sit-in. During the 1970s and the 1960s, the opposition to the Vietnam War began on college campuses. And more recently, in 2018, student survivors from the Parkland school shooting led a national march for gun violence prevention. So why are youth so good at leading movements? Why do we feel so compelled to stand up against injustice? I've been thinking about this question a lot and have come to a few conclusions of my own. Firstly, as youth, we're not beholden to any special interests. Unlike our politicians, whose political stances are often determined by their financial interests, the only thing that we as youth have to lose are our futures and not our fortunes. Secondly, as youth, these issues impact us the most. It's only logical that we be at the fight for justice when these issues are going to impact our entire lives. As a young person, I know that the climate crisis won't merely impact the polar bears, but will instead influence the trajectory of my entire life. This is the reason that during the Vietnam War, it was young people who were at the forefront of the fight for justice. And that's because it was young people who were being drafted. In addition, our optimism is honestly one of our greatest strengths. When I joined the youth climate movement, I thought that it would be a place of fear. After all, fear is what drove me to action. But I have actually met some of the most hopeful people that I know from the climate movement. Hope is the reason that even though the United Nations has only given us 10 years to act on the climate crisis, it's the reason that we still climate strike. Hope is the reason that during the civil rights movement, students truly thought that they could end systemic racism and end segregation. Hope is at the core of all of our movements, and we're going to need it if we are to win. Lastly, as youth, we know the gravity of the situation. Our age is one of our greatest assets. I have been in rooms where I haven't been spoken to as much as the adult in the room simply because I'm 14 years old. I have been in rooms in which I just haven't been taken seriously because of my age. And this phenomenon isn't uncommon with online trolls telling youth climate activists that we've been brainwashed by adults as if we can't even think for ourselves. But when youth stand up, the entire world listens because our leaders know that we should not have to take to the streets just demanding that they care about our lives. We should be in school studying algebra and failing miserably. But unfortunately, we have been forced to take up the mantle when it comes to the climate crisis. And our adults should be slightly terrified. Many have lauded the youth climate movement and the climate strike movement as a whole as a success. And while I wish I could tell you that we are successful, I cannot. After all, we're hardly successful because natural disasters fueled by the climate crisis continue to occur. In Australia, they recently experienced one of their worst bushfire seasons ever. Even worse, the blazes happened in populated areas and gained worldwide attention. 
The fires are part of the reason that koala bears have been declared functionally extinct. And that's not to mention the many, many humans who lost their lives to the fires. In New Delhi, India, the city that I visited on my trip, and one of the most polluted cities on planet Earth, a state of emergency was declared last year. The pollution was so bad that construction projects were halted, schools were closed, and residents struggled to gasp for air. But instead of trying to rectify the situation, the government in India argued amongst themselves about who was to blame for the crisis. I know exactly who's to blame. It's fossil fuel corporations. If one explains the political gridlock around the climate crisis to a small child, it would seem ridiculous. It would seem like something out of a nightmare. And that's because it is. Even here in California, which is one of the most polluted, or which is one of the most um, oil producing states in the entire nation, we are still known as a worldwide leader in climate. The statistics presented are deeply troubling, as are the stories from frontline communities. I wish that I could stand up here today and tell you that everything was going to be okay, that world leaders would come to their senses and prioritize my life over their reputations. I wish that I could tell you that our movement will succeed. But unfortunately, I cannot. I don't know what the future holds for our movement. But what I do know is that each and every one of you in this room has power. And that's power that we need to harness if we are to reclaim our futures. We need to do the unglamorous work of lobbying and organizing and protesting. And we have to fight like our lives depend on it. Because they do. Thank you.